Following her diagnosis of bipolar, Jennifer Kelly Marshall found that reading other people's stories of overcoming mental illness inspired her to start blogging about her own journey. She wrote a first post on her blog, BipolarMomLife.com, in August of 2011. Jen continues to write about why she's grateful for her condition on her own blog, as well as being a regular contributor to the International Bipolar Foundation and PostpartumProgress.com. Most importantly to today, Jen is the creator and founder of This Is My Brave. She will read her essay, My Mental Health Pride Parade. I'll never forget the year my husband and I visited Key West for a mini vacation with friends. We were walking back to our hotel one sticky evening when the streets erupted with joyful noise. People dancing in extravagant costumes, expressing themselves with so much confidence and happiness, it was contagious. It was Gay Pride weekend and everyone was invited to the party. I imagine opening up about having a mental illness for someone who has kept it hidden feels a little like a teen sitting down with his parents to tell them he is gay. Vulnerable, anxious, exposed. Part of me feels like it's no one's business to know that my brain goes haywire if I'm not medicated and haven't been getting enough sleep. And yet the other part of me has such a strong sense of pride for where I've been, what I've experienced, and how far I've come that I want it to be an acceptable conversation during a dinner party or with new friends. It isn't easy for me to talk about the fact that I live with the disease of the mind. Yet it's become my passion to encourage people to talk openly about their illness in an effort to dissolve the stigma that still surrounds mental health disorders. Bipolar is a part of what makes up who I am as a person. It's not all of me, but it's a big part of my life. And I'm proud of my ability to live successfully despite having it. I'm proud of who I am, and I shouldn't have to hide a particular part because people don't understand or appreciate this one unique part of me. I want to be like the taut, tanned, fabulous man I admired in a pink sequin speedo and superhero cape, roller skating his way down Main Street in that Key West gay pride parade. It was a beautiful moment that was celebrated with music, beads, hugs, and love. He's an individual who is proud of one of the things that make him, well, him. I want the world to know that I'm an individual too, with many different parts. And there are others just like me. In fact, a quarter of the individuals in our country alone are like me. 79 million people in the US live with mental illness to be exact. And when you put it in numbers, I don't feel so alone. Yet when mania slaps me in the face so hard that I am left trembling in a corner, unable to slow down the hundreds of thoughts buzzing behind my eyes, I do feel like the only person in the world at that moment. And I wonder, will it ever stop? Will I ever feel normal again? Or is this my new normal? The first time I became manic, I was at the height of my recruiting career. I was managing a portfolio of business that was a professional tilt-a-whirl of clients and candidates. Urgent needs demanded immediate solutions. I was constantly spinning and spinning. My mentor back then used to say that to be successful, you had to keep a fire in your belly. Well, that fire I had in mind apparently spread to my brain. One Friday morning, after sleeping less than three hours a night for an entire week, I began to unravel at the office. It was as if there were all these hidden secrets in the world and I was figuring them all out. I sparkled, giddy with excitement. Words couldn't fly out of my mouth fast enough and I talked in circles, intent on reaching a point, yet never quite making sense. These feelings went on for two days, and by Sunday night, my mania had catapulted into psychosis. When you can see and hear Jesus speaking to you while watching an episode of Lost, the next step is for your husband to call 911. <laughs> At the hospital, they drew my blood. They inserted a catheter since I hadn't gone to the bathroom in hours, yet telling the nurses I had to go, but refused to get up to do so. They even put me through an MRI the next day. I was sufficiently drugged up enough to lay calm on the table, pushed into the tunnel with magnets pummeling the rounded core of the machine that would show the doctor a picture of my broken brain. Despite all these tests, they couldn't reach a conclusion. I was admitted for a psychiatric evaluation. 
three nights in the psych ward, the rest of the week off work, and I was as good as new. At least I thought I was. But just 10 days later, the lack of medication in my system gave way to another episode of psychosis, this time even more intense than the first. A few days before Christmas, I was clearly becoming manic, but it wasn't the totally sick of holiday shopping type mania. My husband consulted my father on the phone, and they both felt the best thing was to stick to our travel plans so they could get me help. Ben managed to get me down to Florida on an evening flight. Because of the dose of clonopin he gave me, convinced me to take before we boarded, I flew under the radar. He kept a close watch on me, remaining stoic, even though I could tell how nervous he was. His composure was what got us to my parents, who were at the ready to do whatever they could to bring me back from my break in reality. We arrived Christmas Eve, and in my agitated state, I didn't sleep the entire night, delirious with the excitement of a six-year-old waiting out for Santa. Only, there wouldn't be any celebrating at our house the next day. Instead, my family would be dropping me off at the local psychiatric hospital. Another day, another psych ward. Only, it just wasn't any other day. It was Christmas Day, 2005. Quite easily, the worst day of my life. It would be three days before they took me home. My parents were able to get me an appointment with this noted psychiatrist. He was the first doctor to give us the preliminary diagnosis of bipolar disorder. I spent the following year in the darkest, most desolate place I've ever been in my life. I didn't know who I was anymore. My recruiting career came to a screeching halt when I wasn't able to function under the normal, everyday pressures of the job. I went from being the last person to leave the office to being the first one out the door when the clock hit five. I was no longer a successful, smart, outgoing young woman. My personality crumbled along with my career. I was trying to run from my anxiety, but it was always there waiting to choke me with its grip and the tornado it caused in my gut. Work-life balance used to be my biggest challenge. Now the hardest part of my day was simply getting out of bed to take a shower. I didn't think I'd ever regain my confidence and wondered if I'd ever even work again. I left my high-paying recruiting job and took a part-time administrative job to pass the time as I focused on getting well. It was all I could handle, just barely. The longest year of my life was 2006. I never thought that I'd be able to make any good come of that year. I oftentimes wished I could just give up. I contemplated suicide. I wanted to end the pain of breathing, to stop the flooded tears I had cried, to make it all stop. I had had enough. Thank God my husband and my parents kept fighting for me. I had given up on fighting for myself. Finally, the right combination of medicine and a desire to get better brought me out of the darkness. I've come a long way since then. In the years following those first two manic episodes and hospitalizations, I lived a life where I hid my mental illness and all the pain I was going through. I hid it from my friends, my extended family, my colleagues at work. But what I realized from those years of burying my struggle was that I wasn't being true to myself. When I began to find my recovery path, I simultaneously found my voice as an advocate, and I knew I needed to use that voice so that others could find hope. I wrote to tell them that if I could do it, they could get well too. I'm a writer, and I've overcome mental illness. I share my story so that others can know that they are not alone. I want to show my kids that it's important to stand up for what they believe in. If not, then why are we here? I believe that having a mental illness should never stand in the way of anyone's dreams. I believe we need to educate the world about mental illnesses so that more friends and family, coworkers, and teachers can reach out to those who need help and get them the help that they need. I believe in standing up, showing up, and writing my way through living with a mental illness. It does not define me as a person, it's just one aspect of my life which has helped shape me into the woman I've turned out to be, a mental health advocate, and I'm pretty I'm proud of her. I'm extremely proud of our debut cast, too. We may not be wearing pink sequin speedos up here like that man in Key West, but these brave individuals up on stage with me today were vulnerable and authentic and real because they want to make a difference in this world. They each shared a piece of their life that you may not have known about, but today our cast stood up here on stage to inspire change. So that's why I believe This Is My Brave is my mental health pride parade.